Welcome to CS210. In this lecture, we're going to talk about a few circuits that we're going to use throughout the rest of the semester that will help us complete our CPU. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about is timing and gate delay. So what that means is when we um, put a new voltage onto the inputs of a gate, let's say we switch this switch right here, and then if we switch this one right here, if you notice, it looks like almost immediately this value went from a zero to a one. But actually what happens in real circuits is when the new voltage hits here, it takes a certain amount of time for the high voltage to come out of the output of the AND gate. And then we have this gate right here, and there's a certain amount of time again that it's gonna take for the low voltage that was here to get replaced with a high voltage onto our output. And that's because it takes electrons time to move through this circuit and to actually get enough electrons flowing to actually change the voltage on the wire. So um, also that doesn't happen immediately. It does take a little bit of time. So it doesn't go from zero to a high voltage right away. It actually ramps up to a high voltage. Now in today's circuits, that time is uh, very, very uh, short, uh, and actually it could even be really hard to measure, but it's still there, and we do have to take account for that when we design our circuits. If we, for example, try to take a measurement or try to take this voltage as our answer when it hasn't had time to go through the gates, then we'll end up getting the wrong answer, reading a zero when the real value is a one. So if we try to run our CPUs too fast, we won't have enough uh, time to go through all of the gates that it goes through. Now this gate delay isn't always bad. The fact that we do have a gate delay allows us to create a circuit like this that's called a flip-flop. And if you notice, the flip-flop has the output going back in to the input. Now because of the gate delay, when the voltages will end up changing this output, it doesn't change immediately, that it kind of allows this to form a stable state. Now this is called an SR flip-flop, and the S is short for set, and the R is short for reset. Now this is the output of our circuit, and what it forms is a memory cell that can remember one bit. So right now the output is what we're remembering, so we're remembering a zero. Now when we turn on the set button, if you notice, and notice I shut it off, that now this circuit is remembering a one. And as long as we, uh, we can take the input off of this circuit, and now this is remembering a bit of data. Now, if we want to change what we're remembering, we could go ahead and say, okay, I want you to now reset or remember the bit zero, so we can turn that on and shut it back off. And now this will remember the bit zero. So a lot of people wonder what this other output is to the circuit, and it's really not another output, but just because we created this circuit, we, we have this uh, wire right here that is always the inverse of this wire up here. So if this is a one, this will be a zero. If this is a zero, then this one will be a one. So to save people using not gates, that they're using this circuit, and they might want to negate this right here, to save people from using not gates, we'll just um, produce this output as well so they could get a negated version of the circuit. So again, this is an RS flip-flop. Now we can take an RS flip-flop and a couple of AND gates and make a JK flip-flop that has a toggle function implemented into it. Now the flip-flops that we're gonna mostly focus on happen to be these D flip-flops. Over here in the memory, we can actually grab out, notice we have the SR flip-flop and the JK flip-flop. We even have the T flip-flop that's in your reading, but we can grab out one of these D flip-flops, which we'll mostly be using. Now, there is a trigger, and we're going to use a rising edge. So by default, it does use the rising edge. And uh, as outputs, notice we have the Q, and we also have the Q naught. So Currently, right now, this flip-flop is remembering a zero, so that's our output. And of course, this is our output negated. Right here, this little triangle is called, uh, input right here, is called the clock. And for now, I'll just 
I'll hook a switch up to that one. And this is our input. So we'll hook a switch up to that one. And I'm going to call this my input right here. Now, the cool thing about this D, uh, this D flip flop is our input could be totally going wild right here. But if you notice, that doesn't affect what this is remembering. And so we can have a circuitry that's producing outputs, and we can even have the timing and the glitches going on, just causing the voltage on this wire to go high and low. Um, but when we get to a certain point, the rising edge of the clock, when this is a clock right here, when this thing goes from a zero to a one, and that's called the rising edge because we have the voltage going low, and then it rises up to a high voltage, then the flip-flop will change what it's remembering. It'll take its input, whatever it is, and if it inputs a high voltage, then it will start remembering a high voltage. And we can see that the output of our circuit is a high voltage. And of course, this is the output negated. So and now our input can be going wild again. And um, because we're calculating something, it can be going from high to low voltage. Our clock can go back down to a low voltage, and still, as our input changes, this memory cell is staying constant. What it's remembering is always a 1. But then, on the rising edge of the clock, it'll take the input and start remembering it instead, and now we have a low voltage that's getting remembered. Now, um, just to show you, if I clock this again from a 0 to a 1, Notice the input is a low voltage. It was remembering a low voltage, but it's still going to keep remembering the low voltage, which is A-OK. -okay. So these are our D flip-flops, and we can use them to remember a number. Now, if we grab 16 of these D flip-flops out and lay them all down, and then hook all 16 clocks up to the same input or the same clock, then we can have uh, 16 memory cells or something that remembers 16 bits. And that's what we call a register. If you notice, we do have registers over here, but uh, they need to be a little bit customized for the labs that we're going to do. So I've actually made these registers for you. So if you go into Canvas and click on your files, you'll see that you have in your files a uh, library called the TSC Library Control. And this has all of the circuits that I've created for you to use. So go ahead and download that file. And you want to put that file in the same folder as your um, file that you're working on, .circ, which is sort, short for circuit. And those are the same uh, extension that you use on your other Logisim files. Now back in Logisim, make sure you have your uh, main circuit open where you built your ALU and your full adder and your MUX. And what we can do is go up to the simulate menu. And I know you can't see it, but the, there is a menu called um, project. You actually want to go to the project menu. And then down you'll see a load library. And go ahead and click on Logisim library. Now you'll see the TSC library control. It's a um, file that you downloaded. Go ahead and click on that and click open. Now we have that library inside of your uh, circuits that you can use. Now, one important thing is um, Logisim has actually not imported all of those circuits into it. It's going to rely on that file. So you can't delete that file and you can't move it. Keep the TSC library control file in the same spot. Also, don't rename it. But inside of here, you have all of the different circuits that we'll be using throughout the rest of this semester. And you can see one of those circuits happens to be a register. So you can go ahead and grab this register out and place it down. As you can see, it has the input, which we call D, and our output, which we call Q. And that's the same thing that we called in our D flip-flops. Notice our input is a D and our output is a Q. So make sure you keep that straight. Sometimes you might grab this register and uh, want to turn it upside down by using your arrow keys. And if you do turn it upside down, remember the input is the D and the output is the Q. So you can't try to put an input onto the output of this or else you break your uh, circuit that way. 
Another thing with these circuits is, I, if you notice, there's a little circle there, and that's supposed to re represent a NOT gate. Actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But sometimes, as you hook up wires to that, you might hook it up to the edge of the circle, but not to the actual wire. So again, just drag your circuit a little bit. And if you can tell it's not hooked up there, drag it all the way there and make sure it's hooked up. So what we could do is we could grab an input and put it on our D. And if you notice, this is 16 of these D flip-flops. So this input needs to be 16 switches, not just one. So we can go ahead and change the data bit width. Now up here in our wiring, we do have a probe so we can see the output here. And go ahead and connect the probe up. And now we can see all 16 of those. And go ahead and hook up a couple of switches to your clock and your clear. Now, if you notice the clear, like I said below, it has that little circle on that that kind of represents a NOT gate. But another way to look at this is that our input is low asserted. So asserted means on. And when we say low asserted, that means we uh, that the zero or a low voltage is on. So this um, register here is being cleared and it's not going to work. So notice the, the rising edge, nothing happens because I'm forcing the, the register to be cleared. And really that's this input line. If you want to reset it, notice the zero right there. You can hook a switch to that and whenever the switch is a high voltage and it will reset it. But the wiring inside here, just to work with the rest of our CPU, this needs to be low asserted, meaning zero is on. So make sure you write that down and memorize it. Whenever you see this little circle right here, that means low asserted, which means that zero is on and one is off. It's switched. So that, and uh, it is a little bit confusing, but hopefully you get used to that. So we'll go ahead and shut our clear off. And we can put an input on here. And if we want the register to remember a new 16-bit number, turn on our clock or go from a low voltage to a high voltage. Again, it's the rising edge that changes it. And now we're remembering a new number. And notice I can uh, change my input to different numbers all I want. And even when that's a low voltage, I can change it all I want until I take this from a low voltage to a high voltage and then it will change the number it's remembering. So we can use this for our four general purpose registers, our program counter, and even the other registers that we're gonna need, the instruction register, the memory address register, and the memory buffer register. So that's a, a register, it's made out of 16 of these D flip-flops. Now the next circuit we're gonna talk about is this tri-state buffer right here. And if you notice, we're still using Q for output and D for input. So what is the purpose of this circuit right here? If you remember, we've already made a MUX that allows us to choose between two different inputs. But those inputs were just a single wire, not 16, and we only had to worry about two. In our circuit, we might have to worry about a lot more than two, like nine different options. And if we have to worry about all those different options, and each option is 16 wires in itself, our MUX will be huge. So we need another way to choose which input we want. Now remember our add, it can add multiple registers like register one or register two or three or four, or I, you know, there is no register four, it's register zero through three. But we anyways, we have a lot of inputs that might wanna go to our ALU and we only want one of them to connect at a time. So this tri-state buffer is like a disconnector. It disconnects something from our uh, output. So let's say that we, we take this uh, output of this register right here and we connect it up to the input of our tri-state buffer. Now, just so we can see, I'm gonna grab a probe so we can see what's coming out of this tri-state buffer hook up this switch. Now again, that circle should tell you that this enable, the, the EN stands for enable, is low asserted. 
So this tri-state buffer is currently on because we have a low voltage onto our low asserted input. The, now we can shut it off and when we shut it off, we disconnect the wires. So now it's not a physical disconnection, it's an electrical disconnection that disconnects the wires. So that way, if we have multiple registers like this, so we have two registers that we want to connect up to our ALU, but not both at the same time. Because if we connected both of them at the same time, if um, right here, let's go ahead and connect both of them at the same time, you have this register that wants this wire to be a one voltage, and this one down here wants it to be a zero voltage. And obviously the circuit's confused. Is this supposed to be a zero or a one? One input is telling me that it should be a one, and another one is telling me it should be a zero. So that leads to conflict. But I want to be able to connect one of these up at a time, not both of them. So if I want to connect this register to my ALU, I could turn on this switch and it creates the connection from this register to my ALU. Now if I want this register connected, and let's go ahead and uh, shut off the reset. Remember, low asserted. So a high voltage means the clear is off. And let's go ahead and clock something in our register. Now let's say that we want this register connected to our ALU. We'll shut that one off. So I disconnected this register from my ALU, turn that one on, and I've now connected this register to my ALU. So the tri-state buffer will be very helpful. We can have up to nine or so different inputs into one of our ALU. You remember we had the bus one and the bus two. We can have up to nine different things that we wanna to connect to that ALU but not at the same time. So every connection will go through this tri-state buffer and the one that we want connected at that moment in time will flip on, will flip that switch low, turning the tri-state buffer on, which forms the connection to our ALU. So the tri-state buffer will be a very helpful uh, circuit for us. Now we also have a two by four decoder, which we'll end up using in our last lab, and I'm gonna explain that before we actually use it. But this is another circuit that I've created for you so that you uh, don't have to create it yourself. This is a eight bit register um, that we're also going to use. And actually you don't need to use it. I've just used it in this uh, circuit right here. And that's gonna be our control unit. We're, our control unit is for a lab later on. 